Today on the show, I have the pleasure of ch- chatting with a really good mate of mine, Ben Lapidus. Now, for those of you who don't know who Ben is, I'm sure you do, but he is the Chief Financial Officer of Spartan Investment Group, where he has applied his finance and business development skills to acquire their current portfolio, which is all based in self-storage. Now, he has also built the uh, the corporate finance backbone of the firm and has organized hundreds of millions of dollars worth of debt and capital to go out and buy and grow Spartan Investment. To top it all off, he's also the the founder and the host of the Best Ever Real Estate Investing Conference. If you haven't been there, definitely check it out. Google Best Ever Conference. Ben Lapidus or Joe Fellas, and it'll come up top of Google search. Definitely check that out. G'day, Ben. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? I'm doing well, Reed. Thanks for having me. Mate, it is good to see you. I swear to God, I had you on this show before because I have I know you're a little bit of your background, but maybe it's because we're, we're, we're good mates that I know that your background so well. But... I, I don't maybe. know if we have, but um, maybe maybe with that IREC. I remember you, you podcasting at IREC, and I was there, but maybe not. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but te- before we get into today's show, can you rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid? Yeah, sure can. Uh, so my 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 pops was one of those guys. It's like I'm going to build a business machine out of my child, right? Like uh, <laughs> six six uh, six years old, he's got me reading Richest Man in Babylon by by Ogmandino. So first dollar I ever made as a kid was actually a poker chip because I wasn't entrusted with dollars. So I got uh, some of those uh, poker chips off of what would now be Amazon, but whatever it was back then. And uh, my dad had me stuffing tapes for what used to be called Amway, now Quickstar Global. He had mm-hmm. me stuffing envelopes for his uh, his marketing agency that he had as a, as a side hustle, as a business. So when I was four, I was I was stuffing tapes for Amway. I was stuffing envelopes for his marketing agency. My dad was a dollar, uh, a hustler, and he used to give me dollars for the work uh, in, in poker chips. And I cashed those poker chips in for things. I was I was buying stuff at the at the family store when I was four. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the reason my whole family went to Disneyland when I was eight years old. So <laughs> I bought uh, that for everyone. <laughs> that, and is he still involved with Amway today? He is not. No, no. I remember I remember getting pitched Amway back in the day when I first started down my entrepreneurial route. I um, I'm surprised they're still around, but clearly, as I just mentioned, that they're rebranded. So um, they're rebranded. Yeah, yeah they, they all- made their way through various different communities in the U.S. Yeah, and in Australia, trust me, they, they, they made it to Australia. So awesome. But mate, walk us through your background and how you've built what you've done today. And you know, be vulnerable with us in terms of where you've come from, because I know you have an awesome background in, you know, you mentioned businesses and building that with your dad, you know, as a young age, but you've gone on to do some, some pretty successful stuff and exit successful businesses over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the 90 seconds, I uh, went to school for finance, thought I was going to be a Wall Street dude. Um, finance and economics, dual majors. Um, started the Rutgers Entrepreneurial Society while I was there, so I obviously had a penchant for for pain um, and in building businesses that that started to blossom at an early age. Um, 2009, had my first internship. I had worked my ass off to be a front office uh, in, uh, person at all the big banks, but 2009 happened, and I ended up getting a a sales and trading job at Barclays Capital right after they bought Lehman Brothers. They were trading exotic credit derivatives. It was the it was the CDOs. It was the stuff that brought the world to its knees. So I just got to be there during the summer to watch all the red get written off in these frozen Obama markets, and uh, everybody was pretty angry. It was not a great place to work. It was not a great industry to be in at the time. Um, and the outside world thought that finance was the devil. So I, I remember I would go to my investment banking job during the day, work the restaurant at night to practice my hundred hour weeks. And you know, all the, all the customers come in and oh, young man, what are you gonna be when you grow up? I'm gonna work on Wall Street. Oh, for the <laughs> devil, great. You know, that kind of imprinted a little bit. So um, I, I decided to, to switch gears and I moved to Costa Rica and started a study abroad company, which is a, a, a big about face more just because I wanted to do something. I just wanted to start a business. And that's the first thing that presented itself to me. I wanted to go to Costa Rica, made a vacation out of it, found myself a, a little random niche and, um, and and built a business out of it with the folks that I started the Rutgers Entrepreneurial Society with. Fast forward three years later, first year out of school, um, we were doing $2 million a year in revenue, bringing uh, 500 kids a year to Costa Rica for 12 days, at four grand a pop, giving them three credits accredited. 80 universities from 10 countries were participating. Um, and I was having a blast. I was at the beach every weekend. I was zip lining, jumping off waterfalls, climbing to the top of 40 foot wind turbines. Um, but it kind of fell apart because of egos and hormones. Got three owners that are 22 years old. Um, so uh, got, got bought out, had that separation. 
Um, invested into my first two single families in 2012, which was really difficult to make a bad decision with. Um, and, and, and worked for ad tech for about five years, just needed a, a place to, to, to rebuild my, my, my pockets. I hadn't gotten my cash out. Um, when I first left, it took me a year to get, to get my buyout. And I was down to 800 bucks in my pocket, living in New York city, barely able to make rent. So, um, tried two other startups that failed, uh, and then went to go work for the ad tech industry. First company that I worked for IPO nine months later and made a bunch of 30 year old VPs, uh, millionaires overnight. And so they, they heard about this kid who bought houses making 20% cash on cash returns with 15 year mortgages in these B grade cities along the East Coast. So they started throwing money at me and I ended up accidentally syndicating um, about two dozen single family properties. And I had 800 bucks to my name, but the deal was I wasn't a broker. I said, you take on all the mortgages, you put in 100% of the capital, I'll find the deal and I'll do all the asset management. Completely turnkey single family before that was a thing. And I take 25% ownership. So when I accrued all of this without any of my own money or credit, I ended up with a half a million dollar balance sheet that I could bring to the bank. So that's how I, I, I accrued my, my net worth just out of thin air. Uh, and so from there, I started syndicating multifamily, learned the things that I was bad at. I also started flipping houses, learned a few more things that I was bad at, I ended up losing close to $200,000 of other, other investors' money, which was the best lesson that I've ever learned. Um, and uh, moved to, to, uh, to Denver because of my wife, um, decided to start the best ever real estate investing conference so that I could put myself in a national forum to meet some like-minded people. And as a result of that, found business partners that helped me uh, switch gears from single family residential world to the, to the world of self-storage. We bought our first asset in 2018. And over the last four years, we've accrued almost a half a billion uh, in self-storage assets on our way to a billion. So that's the that's a little bit more than 90 seconds, but there you go. Well, I, I didn't ask for 90 seconds and uh, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you volunteered it, my friend, but that's, uh, that's an incredible story. I, I was trying to keep count of all the businesses. So Costa Rica, there was New York, there was an ad tech, there was two apparently other startups in there. There was a single family by yourself. There was single family syndications. There was then then, then the, the losing of the $200,000, then starting of the best ever conference, now self-storage and half a billion. Did I get yeah, that right? I did a lot of experimentation in my first <laughs> professional decade. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you have to. I think that's the lesson, right? It has to be a little bit of trying of everything to, to make sure you understand where you know where you're going to. So, you know, today, and I'm gonna we're gonna go back and unpack a bit, but what's been the biggest lesson coming through where you stand and sit today with all that experience and the trying of all the things? Yeah, I I would say that there's lots of technical lessons that I've learned, right? There's there's lots of uh of, of important knowledge that I've gained that have helped differentiate me in the marketplace and differentiate our investment thesis in the real estate world. But I think the, the most important thing that I learned along the way, two things I'll, I'll mention, is, uh, is this hedgehog principle concept, something that Eric Reese mentions in the Lean Startup Machine, which is whether it's a career or a business, you should spend your time professionally at the intersection of three things. And most people only focus on one. And if you're lucky, you get to two, but really blowing it out of the water is all three. And that intersection is something that you're passionate about, something that is economically viable, and something that you're great at, that you can be a category of one with. And, 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 I, and, I, and people say, oh, follow your passion, follow your dream. And then other people say, don't follow your passion, don't follow your dream. It needs to be economically viable. The reality is it's both. It needs to be at the intersection of all three things. So I had, I had this, uh, this upbringing where I was focused on economic viability until I was 19 years old. And I realized that Wall Street was not going to be a good time. And I moved to Costa Rica and I started to study abroad company, partying and zip lining and jumping off waterfalls for three years. And that was a great time. And I learned that I have to have fun. I wasn't passionate about the work, but I was having a great time. I was chasing fun. And then when I got into the real estate industry, um, Chris Clothier of Memphis Invest, he was the first keynote speaker at the Best Ever Conference 2016. You were a speaker there too. You remember that, 2017. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I sat down with him for, lunch, uh, for dinner and he said, when it comes to turnkey real estate investing, we are a category of one. We are the best at it. And at the time it was true. I don't know about today. At the time it was absolutely true. And so... I got, I got to noodling on, you know, what are my superpowers and how can I complement that with other people's superpowers so that we can become a category of one? Maybe that's a very niche peer play way of doing things, but at least we'll be the best inside that peer play. Uh, and so that's the focus. And now I get to work on my superpowers. So something that I'm fantastic at, I get to uh, lean into my ADD and my shiny object syndrome by working on deals, right? I'm still in finance. So I, I'm, I enjoy the heck out of my work. 
and I'm doing it in an industry with people like you uh, it, it, having a great time. It's a lot of fun. So I, I, I have, after all this experimentation, found myself at the intersection of that three circle Venn diagram. That That's really interesting because you, you, you are correct that so many people talk about being passionate. And if you do something that is you're passionate about, the money will come, right? But you also sometimes it doesn't just come. You, you can only be, you know, I'm thinking of like, uh, being an artist, right? It's it's such a such a hard thing to crack and be a very wealthy person at the same time. Usually, most artists are pay- paycheck to paycheck and have to have a second job. So, finding that economically viable solution is really what I think you know drives a lot of people. For you, was 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 you know financial independence ever? Uh, you know that that economic viability push that was trying to get you into the real estate world initially. Hundred percent. Or, or even I shouldn't even say real estate. I should say starting any business, right? Because you clearly have, you know, uh, sort of a, a nous for wanting to go out and sniff out the, the entrepreneurial, you know, startup sort of thing. So w- was that to become free and not have to work for anyone else? I, I, I'm i okay being a leader. I'm okay being a general of somebody else's army. It's so, it's not so much about wanting the the, the freedom of uh, of control over what I do. I, I like direction when it when it works. And I'm also okay taking charge too. I, I've built those skills. I know when to lead and I know when to follow. And I'm, and I'm good at both now. Um, it was more so the freedom of what I was doing outside of work. Satisfying, I, I would not find myself stimulated or satisfied uh, with my expectations for my life if I maintained a W-2 income. Because mm-hmm. that's all happiness is, right? And that's what we're chasing, happiness. Uh, a good dopamine drip through our life, you know, based on our definition, our definition of wealth and happiness. And happiness is typically defined by defined by reality divided by expectations. The higher your expectations are, the more difficult it is to find happiness in your reality because your reality needs to meet those expectations. If you have really low expectations, it's a lot easier to produce a reality that generates happiness. That's why we see people who have less that are happier than people who have more because mm-hmm. they have higher expectations. And I was imbued with a set of very high expectations in my childhood. That is my operating system. That's my programming. So I knew that I had to go hunt to, to produce the reality to match my expectations. And um, I, I have leaned into the things that I enjoy such that I find stimulation. I found a way to match my need to create that reality with what I enjoy along the way so that the journey is just as desirable as the destination. That's, that's, I think the key is now I'm, now I'm just full of gratitude. I have the business that I want. I have the family that I want. I got my three lovely kids. I live in the state that I want. I have produced what I want and I'm not at the pinnacle. I'm not at the apex, but I know that I'm, I'm in the good old times right now. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you stop the mind from wanting more? Because that's that's the that's the hamster wheel everyone gets on, right? You get to that some some element of success, some drip of success, but there's always going to be another mountain. So yeah. how do you how do you how do you keep that expectations in check? More of what I would argue. More right. Well, that's what I'm asking. What, yeah, yeah. what is your more of what? So you know you know like that that uh, that Wall Street movie with Shia LaBeouf and uh, mm-hmm. what's his name Josh Brolin. He's like, how, what's your number? He just goes more, <laughs> and, and like that's not me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I looked at what do I want out of my life? I, I do not want to measure myself based on uh, a, a currency based number. That is not my singular KPI for what I would define as success for my life. I see the monetary resources that I'm being allocated from my participation in our economy as a tool to produce uh, outcomes in other KPIs for my life. So um, what I'm looking for now is the best return on time not the best return on investment, not the best raw dollar income. I want to hit a certain net worth. And then beyond that, my efforts professionally are about producing the best return on time. Because I look at the spectrum of what this existence has to offer. And industry is very stimulating. It's very exciting. It's fast paced. It's enjoyable. You can, you can enjoy the game of industry. But there's other, there's other ways to uh, process this existence and have more diverse experiences. And I enjoy diverse experiences, whether that's um, in academia or nonprofit sector or government or travel and leisure or uh, arts and entertainment. There's other ways to live this life. And so um, I would like to add more diversity into my lived experience. So by producing the best return on time, I can open up my life to invite more opportunities for personal growth and introspection in these other arenas of what this reality has to offer. Has that always come naturally? 
That's what always comes to well, well, mindset. Th- yeah, that mindset because I'm sure, th- and I'm, I'm I'm sort of thinking back to your story. I'm sure some of the I don't want to say failures, but the tripping has you, you mentioned testosterone and you know breakups of companies. And you and I have had personal conversations about us, you know, things that things get to a pedestal that everyone starts getting a bit of elbowy. Has that so is this current mindset come from those lessons of of of, of you know the ups and downs that you've experienced? Uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll get a little heady here. So so you know, stop me and, and put me back <laughs> on track if if I do, but um, I, no, I would say no. I, I mean, vanity metrics is is uh, is a sign of youth. I think, right? So I, I think we all kind of come out of school or we get into our businesses and and we assign vanity metrics as our as our yardstick for success and kind of measure them up against other people. Um, I, I would say that I, like anybody else, came out of my childhood with certain insecurities, uh, and and I think that's part of what adulthood is is um, becoming aware of your prior programming and and um, being introspective and cerebral about what those insecurities are and why you have them and and working through them. So I, I, I would say that probably supplanting those vanity metrics was very helpful. You know, to say I, I had a vanity metric and I've exceeded that, that certainly helps. Uh, but I don't think that I've I've pushed the yardstick further because I've been introspective as to why that metric was my vanity metric to begin with. Um, and I, I I would say that the the biggest inflection point for me in that shift was finding the right partner who who questioned my values, who questioned my conclusions, um, and who kept asking me why um, to make sure that I was focused on on what those right metrics are. Um, you know, you you get married, you start a family, and um, your priorities shift, right. and and that's not a bad thing. It's right. not a bad thing. Talk yeah. to me about. Spartan Capital, you know, you, 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 Spartan Investments, I should say. Um, yeah. You, you started that in 2018, I believe, right? That was, was that you, you mentioned that was through the best ever conference. You know, obviously you host that. That's if people don't know what that is, again, I encourage people to Google best ever conference. You'll find Ben's pretty face alongside Joe's. Um, how did that, how did that come about? How did the best ever conference come about? Or no, how no, no. How, how, how did Spartan? Yeah, so Spartan Investment Group was started in 2014 uh, by Scott Lewis and a college buddy. Uh, Ryan Gibson joined one year later. They were flipping houses in D.C., doing very, um, uh, very impressive creative flips in D.C., you know, taking a brownstone for a single family and turning it into a four condo uh, uh, property with a pop top or a dig out or both. Um, so it, it had half million dollar margins. I found that very impressive. Like the construction management, the, the ability to, to blow through the permits and the planning processes of those things. Meanwhile, I had accrued over 50 units and I was a, I was a cash flow king. I had created great cash flow and I had lost $200,000 trying to flip, right? So like I knew what my strengths were and I knew what my weaknesses were. I knew that I was great at underwriting, deal making, negotiating, um, capital markets, acquisitions. Um, being able to just do anything quantitatively, I had a, had a natural intuition for, and I had the posture to be a good negotiator as well and just make good deals. Um, but managing vendors, property managers, construction managers, business operations, not my, my natural strong points. Anything that had to do with organization or uh, things that ADD don't support, not great. <laughs> I like to lean into my shiny object syndrome with the transaction level side. So um, when we when we started the Best Ever Conference in 2016, we had our first uh, event in 2017. I accidentally invited Scott Lewis to be the very first speaker. Um, it was a, it was an accident, but it was a happy accident. He was rated third best speaker that year in our in our uh, speaker survey. And by consequence of that first interaction, he had just moved to Denver. I had just moved to Denver uh, within a month of each other. We started skiing together, uh, spending a couple couple of weekends uh, a month for about a year. And when my New York City role after having moved to Denver started to wrap up, um, Scott and Ryan, uh, who were now the only two people working in Spartan Investment Group, were starting to say, you know, our DC flips, that's not really a, a business we want to be in anymore. Our margins have been squeezed. They had just started going through what Scott calls the military decision-making process to evaluate what our investment thesis should be. And I kind of jumped in right at that time uh, with our, my complementary skill set. And we concluded storage was the right answer. Um, and in 2007, 2017, we bought our first parcel for ground up development. We bought our first asset in 2018, a pre-existing asset. And in 2019, it started to scale from there. That's incredible. And wh- how have you scaled the company? Give us a snapshot of what it looks like today. Yeah. So uh, the, the way that we've scaled the company um, is by taking a massive step back and pretending that we were a thousand person company with when we had five people here. And we focused on three things, strategy, culture, and people development. 
strategy, culture, and people development. Because at the executive level, those are the three things that you should really be focused on. If you're hustling, raising capital, doing deals, and you've got a hundred person team and you are at the top and you're not focused on strategy, culture, people development, not just one of them, but all three, you're definitely not preparing yourself for skilled growth. So um, we focused very heavily, very early on, on what are our values? What do they mean? What's our mission statement? Let's pick it apart. What's our vision statement? What's our creed? What's our, our guiding principles for how to operate with good judgment, freedom, and responsibility for our team members so that we don't create a bureaucracy that's slow to move? Um, what is our strategy? Let's look at a three-year plan. Let's go through the military decision-making process by going through our environmental scan, identifying courses of action, evaluating those courses of action, um, uh, and then ultimately selecting one and building a, a plan around that. What is the infrastructure that we're creating with annual key initiatives, quarterly rocks, uh, KPIs, and, and ongoing tasks uh, for ourselves and our team members so that we can keep ourselves on track? And then finally, how are we uh, identifying, recruiting, retaining people, and developing them to be leaders? inside of our organization so that they can take on the free, the, the decision-making processes that we're pushing down to free ourselves up to move on to the next things so that we can adequately scale. Those are the three things that we focused on very early on and continue to do so as we as we grow the company. People are watching, there's a book in the background called Traction. It sounds exactly like uh, all, all those little nuggets that you were saying were coming exactly you know. from, from that yeah, one book. <laughs> um, but that's no, that's it's incredible to see how you guys have grown because I know it was um, it, it, you're moving across the country. Like, you know, I think Ryan's in Seattle, you're in DC, uh, not DC, in Denver, you're doing flips in DC. It, it does sound very, you know, disjointed. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then now focus on what you, you know, those three vi visions, strategy, culture, people development, I think is really, really important in and around growing something for the future. So what does, how many, how many people you got working now at Spartan? What does it look like? Because I know you, I've seen you guys grow quite quickly over the last uh, handful of years. Yep. I just heard yesterday we're at 92 people. We should be at hundred wow. by, uh, by September. Um, that breaks out to about 50 uh, on-site managers and about 40 ish. Uh, corporate level staff. Got it. And that's all between Denver, in Denver? Uh, about 30 something in Denver and 10 in Seattle. Nice. Nice. Who, what's, what's Seattle do out there? Yeah. Okay. So Seattle's our capital team. So uh, we, we've got three capital strategies, our, our public debt, our private debt, and our equity. Our capitalism. Yeah. No, I've, I've uh, interviewed Ryan Gibson. I think that was at IIREC. That's probably where you saw you me go. speaking about it. Um, so so with, with all this great growth, what's where is the company going? Where is it going for you personally as well? Like what's, is there an end goal in sight right now? Because the, you, know, you talk about vision and, and, and culture, but it has to have a rudder at some point, right? Where, where, where does it make sense to you know, the target to be? Is, is it is it, a, is it to sell it at some point? And I'm talking, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, it's it's funny, I, I come from like a tech startup world from, from a decade ago before being in the real estate space. And the mantra there was, do not keep your eye on the exit. Keep your eyes as far away from the exit as possible. Keep your right. options as open as possible. Focus on building for success and for growth and the exit options will present themselves. And that's that's kind of the mindset that I've maintained. Um, and, and we've introduced as much flexibility and choice into our exit plans for our real estate holdings as possible. We've got four or five different strategies for every asset that we have. If we're limited to one, we don't buy. Um, and it's, the same thing is true for our opco. Uh, originally, there, so we're at the end of our three-year strategic plan. We had a 22, 2020 to 2022 strategic plan. And in that plan was written um, a competency in three asset classes. So right now we focus on self-storage. And originally we wanted to be able to diversify outside of self-storage that if some adverse conditions entered the storage space, we had options for transacting in other assets. It was a, more of an anti-fragility strategy than anything else. But the opportunity has been so strong in self-storage that we've maintained focus. And we said, let's not get distracted with other asset classes. And I think that's just as true today, despite the macroeconomic conditions that we're living in than, than prior. Uh, the, the runway for storage is still very long. The opportunity for growth is still fantastic. The fragmentation in the space still hasn't been taken fully advantage of. Um, so we're, we're still laser focused on self-storage. Um, you know, we're at half a billion today. I don't see that runway um, being limited until we're in the five to 10 billion range. So we, we've just got so much room for growth. You no, know, is it to be sold? No. Is it to be Blackstone? No, but also yes to both. I, I, mm -hmm. yep. you know, just, just keep growing, uh, not for the sake of growth, but for the sake of self-growth. So I, I'm not really interested in growth for the sake of growth. I'm interested in growth because of my shiny object syndrome, because of how obsessed I am with putting myself in positions that I get to learn more about who I am and what I'm capable of. 
That is like my favorite thing about industry right now, more so than the money, is that I get to continuously learn at a higher velocity about who I am, what I'm capable of. I get to battle test myself and what my values are and question them more regularly and become a more poised, rooted person into who I am and what I believe. Uh, so I'm going to continue to want to do that as long as the opportunities to, 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 to battle test myself keep presenting themselves in front of me. That's awesome. No, and I think it's very clear in terms of having, because when you mentioned tech startup, I was like, oh, exit, 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 right? Everyone's like, flip, 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 flip that baby until we can get, you know, get out. Um, but having, don't be obsessed with the exit options, I think is very wise uh, because it is, as an entrepreneur, there is the tendency to look at that, right? You know, mm -hmm. particularly coming from the tech world, you, you know, it is a, where can we scale it to a point where we can get a big exit and I can go do, you know, business number two or three. And, and hearing your story, you've already done so much in such a short period of time. So uh, I'd love to do this interview in 10 years time and see if, uh, see if you're still at Spartan or not, 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 not in a disrespectful way, just more no, no, in, no, a, yeah, yeah. in a curiosity way, because I think there's so many people in entrepreneur, particularly on this show, you're just constantly curious, right? You're constantly got to be challenged, and and that's the biz that's the beauty of building something from scratch. I think that's what everyone is 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 uh, is drawn to. And if you can get a big exit, fantastic. Or you can keep scratching your itch in terms of the growth, and then fantastic as well. Um, so with that being said, what do you what do you focus on personally? I know we mentioned in the green room before we press uh, record, you've got a you just had a little baby boy, and he baby is boy. Uh, he's coming along. What what else are you doing outside of the real estate world? to keep you, you know, the best ever been? The best ever been. Well, um, I, uh, I like to pretend that all of my studies are for the purpose of uh, being, being a better economist and a, and a better <laughs> predictor of patterns. And, and a lot of that's true. Um, but I have, I have found, um, you know, when, when you've got three kids under the age of four and you've got, you know, uh, a, a company of, of 40 people that, that you're managing and, and, and in a certain way, there's, there's some similarities between those two lives. Um, there's a, there's a, not a lot of time. Uh, so I, I found audiobooks have been really stimulating. So I, I've made a bit of a study out of anthropology, a bit of a study out of physics. I've gotten really into quantum physics. And um, if you're going to ask me my best ever book during the lightning round, I'm sure you are best ever book, excuse me. If you're going to ask me about <laughs> a book in the lightning round, um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm really into studying other things that expand my understanding of the flow of ideas and the flow of evolution and, and the flow of our universe. Um, I, I, specifically, Yuval Harari wrote Homo sapiens, Homo Deus, um, other anthropology books. Like I, I made a study of this book called Work and just having the mindset of a 12,000 year trend to watch, like how the, how the Homo sapiens species has progressed over time um, is so much more interesting than thinking in terms of the last 90 years, because those are the people that I've been exposed to in conversations for the first 30 years of my life, being able to read uh, books about like the history of economics and seeing how that social science came together, being able to see the history of how quantum physics science, sciences came together at the turn of the century. Um, it, it helps shape an understanding of ideological evolution. And if you can see how ideas throughout our species evolve over time and uh, accumulate over time as we become more connected, you can kind of start to predict how different ideas might uh, shift our approach as a species going forward. What's our agenda now that we've kind of conquered war, disease, and famine for the most part, which was kind of our agenda for the last 500 years. Um, and, and, and those things can help you become a better investor. You can see the patterns um, if you understand the movement of things and the movement of ideas over time. So that doesn't really answer your question, but <laughs> that's keeping me really intellectually stimulated, doing a lot of hiking, a lot of skiing, spending time with the kids. Um, and yeah. <laughs> awesome. awesome. I think yeah. we could have a whole episode on just on what you, what are you scratching outside the real estate world? Just before we get into the uh, top five investing tips, what are your sort of thoughts on where we are right now? In, in, in I'm sort of asking everyone who's coming on this show because yeah. it's been we've 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 come together, we've grown up together in terms of coming through the 2012s, 13s, 14s, and had successes. Now we're into a little bit different times as operators. What are you seeing in the real estate world and, and macroeconomics? I mean, you, you, I think you and I got started pretty much around the same time. So like getting started right after the last recession, we've just been waiting for this for, for forever, right? So I feel like a kid in a candy shop. Like I'm in a toy store, just like, is it finally happening? I've been waiting for this for 12 years. <laughs> right? Like 
you got to see everybody else make a killing on the last upswing and, and we've just been waiting for our turn. So, um, and on one hand, it, I, I want to be as conservative as possible. On the other hand, I want to be as excited as possible. Um, so, so here, here's my thoughts. We, we, we're, we're seeing in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was like two days ago, two, two announcements came out. One, first time we've had negative uh, transaction growth in the commercial real estate sector, um, uh, May over May of last year to this year. You can see from the last four or five months, just that growth has just like started to dip and now we've dipped into the negative round. round. Um, so you know, we're hearing in the space that industrial transactions have slowed. We're starting to see price corrections there, hotel, office, even multifamily, just a little bit. I think the last two holdouts are on the major food groups are retail and self-storage. Um, but we are starting to see just a little bit of softening in the self-storage space, tiny, tiny, tiny bit. I'm not expecting that much correction anywhere in the single families and self-storage and multifamily. Uh, I know that the, the other article that I mentioned was that Janet Yellen is suggesting that inflation is, is expected to continue to stay high despite all the interest rate movements that have happened already and another point of movement over the next 40 days. She's still expecting um, uh, inflation to stay high. So I, I, I would underwrite short term interest rates. I would stress test them to be pretty high, like like a like a risk free rate of five, six, seven percent which is a solid movement from zero to 1% that we've experienced for a long time. But to me, while that looks scary from a short-term perspective, it looks like opportunity to me from a mid to long-term perspective. Because if interest rates go up, which they have already, and cap rates haven't adjusted, which in our space they haven't, there's no spread. If, mm. if you're underwater on your spreads, if your arbitrage is negative, how do you buy? You're, you're the only people that can buy have cash. Well, the answer is, um, when cap rates do adjust, even if your spreads are a lot thinner, at some point in time, we will overcorrect. Whether it takes two years for this Russian war to go away or not, whether it takes however much time to get off of you know, oil issues, uh, not investing into more oil and our oil prices being so high, however long it takes, at some point, it will swing in the other direction. And the Fed is going to be freaking out doing the exact same thing that they're doing in the other direction, deploying just as many tools uh, to, to move um, inflation or unemployment or whatever they're trying to push in the other direction. And cap rates will have been locked in at the prices that we purchased them at when they were elevated in response to the current movements. So if we can lock in higher cap rates today with the expectation that interest rates are going to go down tomorrow, then over the long term, our spreads are actually going to be higher as long as you can float that spread over time. It's a little bit of a gamble. It's a little bit of a gamble that doesn't last forever. And you can lose money when you gamble. So what we're doing to hedge is we're making sure that we're buying highly occupied assets with very below market rents. So even if we're, we're buying them at negative spreads based on today's performance, if you know, self-storage is a great inflation hedge because we can move rents within 30 days of, of purchasing it. And we can move it again 30 days after that. And again, 30 days after that. So we can move rent in response to inflation as far as the, the particular market can push us. So if we can push rents 40% in a six month period, that might accommodate for our overpayments on debt service while locking in a higher cap rate such that long-term we have higher spreads. So that's kind of the thesis that we're toying with at the moment. For anyone who's paying attention, uh, you have to re, 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 rewind that and make sure Ben gets that again. But what he's essentially saying is, yeah, today you've got to be buying stuff with adding value, which is what I'm always hearing. It's always constantly adding value. So whether it's in the rents, even if you are negative in cap rates versus interest rates, which, you know, let's face it, we all are, if you're actively buying the last 12 months, it's probably what you, you, you've been doing. Um, but you have to be sure that you're adding that value. And the value creation comes in knowing your market in terms of where the rents are today. And that's what I do on the multifamily side. That's what Ben does on the self-storage side. And backing into, you know, that is your hedge against, you know, quote unquote risk because you know where the market is going to. So, um, you, yes, you might be buying at a two and a half cap. But you know, in stabilization, it might be a, a four and a half or a six cap. So, Ben, I've had an absolute pleasure having you on the show, mate. Uh, at the end of every show, we'd like to dive into the top five investing tips. Ready to get into it? Let's do it, mate. What is the number one daily practice that you keep on on track for towards your goals? I express gratitude, but not in a notebook. I tell my kids and my wife every day what I'm grateful to them for. My business partners, if I can. <laughs> If they're listening. <laughs> Question number two is what's been the, who's been the most influential person in your career today? Yeah, I, I would say there's three, the, the three people that who impacted each of those three circles. 
Um, uh, so, so number one uh, is is my folks, the people who got me economically minded, who who kind of set those really high standards for myself, and uh, who, who demanded more of me than what is normal for for kids. Um, the second is uh, one of my business partners who, who uh, I had three in that study abroad company. Um, two were my age and one was twice my age. And that one, he was a little bit out of his mind, but he taught me to chase fun and, and, and to make sure that was included in my life, make sure my life had color and my business dealings had color. And, and enjoyment in them. And then, and then number three, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to my two business partners who made sure that we are going to be the best at what we do. It might be very niche. It might be very limited, but we're going to be the best inside that circle. That's awesome. That's awesome. Love it. Uh, question number three is what's the most influential tool in your business? So when I say tool, it could be a phone, like a physical tool. It could be a book or it could be a, you know, an actual piece of software that you use as a tool that you just can't run your business without. What is it? AirPods. 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 And you know why? Because you, you, you get so few moments, you know, when, when you're, when you're operating at this kind of velocity, you get so few moments to do something for yourself. And so the AirPods, I, I have to make sure I'm building scaffolding around my ADD to like stay on track and I don't trip over myself. Right. So the, the AirPods, they give me notifications in my ears. They let me know it's time to be done. So, you know, like I'm in meetings all the time with an AirPod in, in one ear. And, you know, when I, when I do get five minutes in between things, I like flip that book back on and I get five more minutes of content. When I'm riding in the car, I can make sure that I've, I, I can, I can do a call or I can do my audio book if I'm on a plane or whatever. So the AirPods, um, I do really well with consuming audio information versus visual information. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's accelerating my understanding of what's going on around me by having something speaking in my ear, telling me about it all the time. <laughs> Love it. Love it, mate. Uh, question number four in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure in your career to date? And what did you learn from that failure? And the biggest failure that I've had to date was doing a bunch of flips with, with hubris, without hubris. I always forget what that word means. Um, without humility. So I guess with hubris um, and thinking that I could just automate this thing, you know, this, mm. this very corner specific asset specific jurisdiction specific type of business model. I could just run it on autopilot. I can, I can find other vendors and they'll do it all for me and have them speak to each other, build the systems and processes. Well, it turns out I'm terrible at that. T- terrible at building systems and processes. I lost not only all the upside, but also all the principal plus extra cash that I dumped into the business to try and, get it back on track, ultimately failing to get it back on track and having to fire sale some assets. So um, the lesson that I, I learned a couple of lessons, what I'm bad at, what I need to complement, which is my vendor management, my construction management. I just don't like to stay involved uh, uh, in the operations. I, I've kind of learned to mitigate that a little bit, but I'm still not excellent at it. And I'll always need people to support me to do that. The second thing I learned is don't always follow the operating agreement, follow your own internal compass. Uh, when I lost everybody's money, it was an equity play. I didn't have to pay them anything because it was an equity play. I was the operator and I lost all the money. But this wasn't, this wasn't alpha risk. You know, this, this was operator error. Uh, and I felt like I had lost all the money, not the conditions of the asset, not the conditions of the market. I had made the mistakes. So I had to, I had to get the cash together, but I got everybody their cash back plus 8.5% annualized. And to me, I think I was 25 at the time. I have a 60 year runway of doing business. I'm not going to launch it by having this be my, my reputation that I lose people's money, right? Like I'm going to set my reputation, right? Um, It felt like the right thing to do. And that's paid dividends since then. That's awesome. That's awesome, dude. No, love it. And I think that's such a great way to set you up for for success. Thinking about the sixty year runway rather than you know what's going to happen if you have to come out of pocket a little bit when you're twenty five years of age. I'm sure you're yep. still going to survive, yep. mate. Last question is: Where can people reach you to continue the conversation? That want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Yeah, you want to go to the best ever conference because it is the best place to congregate for all commercial real estate investors, passive investors, operators, syndicators. Uh, one place every year, Salt Lake City, Utah, March 8th through 10th, besteverconference.com. Or if you want to hit me up by email, you can check me out at spartan-investors.com. Awesome stuff, my friend. Look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today to share your incredible knowledge. Just to reflect what I took away from today's show, I think is, you know, I, I love talking about the culture and focusing on the three things that your, your company needs to be good at and having the ability to look forward to when you may become a thousand people or what it takes to become a thousand people, even though you only have five people right now. I also, love watching your journey because I've known you personally for so many years come through uh, some really 
awesome times. And now coming out the other side where you've got a, a company that Spartan is really the uh, the pinnacle of, in the self-storage space. And you've cre- you've been there to create it all from scratch. So so well done. Um, and you know, in the last little bit, I think I, I could get you back on the show and talk to you a lot more about the history of economics and, and the way you think, because it sounds like you're a deep thinker. And I'd love to hear some recommendations maybe after the show of some books you're reading outside of real estate. But yeah, but sure. without that, with that being said, did I forget anything in that summary? Oh, no, that's great. Awesome, that's mate. Great. Look, thank yeah. you so much for jumping on the show. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Thanks for having me, Reid. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam packed with some incredible advice from Ben. Remember, head over to thebesteverconference.com or just you know, Google Best Ever Conference. It's coming up here in Salt Lake City uh, in March next year. Definitely get along. I've been speaking at that for many, many years. It's an incredible cracking event that everyone gets to in the industry. If you're looking to get started in this industry, go to that event. Uh, with that being said, I want to thank you all for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. If you do like the show, give it a five-star review on iTunes. All the show notes will be up on my show on my website, I should say, at reedgoosens.com. And we're going to do it all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. Hold up. 